In this video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. As you can see, we're not at our desks, we're in the Swiss Alps, and we're going to use this shoot as an opportunity to test out the brand new Komodo X. This is not your normal shoot. We're going to be away from roads and power, walking in the mountains. So everything that we're shooting with, we need to carry on our backs. What kit have we brought? Was bringing the Komodo X a smart choice? And does the footage look any good? If you're interested in the answers, keep on watching. Let's talk about kit, but first a quick disclaimer. All of the equipment that we're using to shoot this video is ours, with the exception of the Komodo X. That's a loner from Red, but you're gonna hear our opinions and Red has no editorial control over the content that we're creating. If you want to know if the Komodo is any good, the best place to start is by looking at the footage it produces. We're on a through hike in the mountains. I'm always on the lookout for opportunities to shoot footage that I can use for training. So I can't miss this opportunity. You'll see the journal pop up every now and again, I've got a plan to use this as motivation for some fusion-based motion graphics that I can composite into the environmental shots. All my kit is packed into a Shimodo Action X. It's a great bag. I've brought three lenses, all Canon EFL series, a 16 to 35 F4 IS, a 70 to 200 F4 IS, and a 24 F1.4. I bring F4 lenses because they are lighter, and the 24mm f1.4, well, I've already got that focal length covered in my zoom, but I carry the prime for low light shooting. These are mounted with a Canon R to EF adapter. Iris is controlled electronically by the Komodo. The Komodo is ideal for hiking because as cinema cameras go, this thing is tiny and light. This is real run and gun stuff. There are a lot of miles to cover each day. You gotta keep moving, but you don't want to miss opportunities. A 6K sensor and high frame rates are handy for that. 6K means you can reframe without resolution loss in UHD. And high frame rates makes it easier to capture a meaningful amount of footage from even the most fleeting of moments. Footage is a mixture of medium quality and high quality, either 24, 48 or 72 frames per second. I usually work in multiples of my base rate as it makes it easier to speed footage back up to real time in post. I only got the camera a few days before we left, so no time to prep. But the camera is super intuitive. I'm so happy with the footage the Komodo has captured. It's a gorgeous image. But image quality isn't the only factor when choosing a camera. So why would I want to shoot with a Komodo X? And why might you want to shoot with one? Choosing a camera is a topic that we'll cover in depth in a future video. For now, here's the cliff notes. I look for the three Fs. That's form, function, and fun. Let me explain what I mean. The form factor of the camera is important. I really like modular cameras that can be built up or stripped down as needed. It needs to be easy to build too. I don't want to have to faff with cumbersome cages and rod systems, and ideally it should be toolless. Also, it needs to look professional on a shoot. So as a box camera with native V mount and plenty of hard mounting points, the Komodo ticks that box. A flexible lens mount is a must. Short flange distances can be easily adapted to mounts with longer flange distances. The Komodo has a Canon R mount, that means for the smallest possible package, I can use R lenses, or for more serious productions, or perhaps to support legacy lenses, I can adapt it to formats like PL or EF. That's another win. What about function? The camera's no good if it doesn't produce a beautiful image, use robust codecs, and give flexible shooting options. Well, the Komodo 6K already produced a great image. The X promises to improve on that, especially in low light. We'll have to see how it looks, but it seems promising. The KX can record ProRes internally, but you're not getting the most out of this camera unless you use red code. It's got an incredibly high bit depth and because it's a raw codec, decisions like white balance and ISO are not baked into the image. You can alter them in post. Now, just to be clear, non-raw codecs also offer the same flexibility in post, so red code's not the only great codec out there. Finally, fun. I want to enjoy the cameras I use. The less frustration the camera causes me with its accessories, rigging, menus, and general usage, the more energy I have for creativity. What are the menus like? Is connectivity any good? Does it make me happy when I pick it up or do I roll my eyes? We'll see. Now this video isn't gonna be super technical. I know the Komodo X is a good camera. I'm more interested in seeing what it's like to work with, whether I enjoy it. There are plenty of other videos out there that you can watch to learn more. Hopefully this video will complement those. 
The Komodo X contains an IMU that records camera movement. That data can be used for things in post like stabilization. This is my first time using a camera that records gyro data and my first time using the software GyroFlow. Now, GyroFlow isn't red specific software. It just supports the gyro data recorded by the Komodo. The basic workflow goes something like this. Record your shaky footage, create a profile for your lens and camera, and this only needs to be done once for each lens that you use, and then stabilize your footage with software. This is not the same as the stabilizer that's built into Resolve or Premiere, which basically guesses the camera's motion. It's way better as it uses the movement recorded by the camera's internal IMU. Why is this significant? Because if the gyro stabilization is good, I don't need to carry a gimbal. Now, I will admit, mistakes were made, but from what I've seen, this is really promising. My biggest issue was not setting a fast enough shutter speed. GyroFlow can remove the camera motion, but it cannot remove motion blur from camera shake. A wider lens would have been helpful too, as it helps you keep your action in the frame. But then the image would have to be cropped further. So even though you're shooting with a 6K camera, your stabilized extract might only be 2K. Now it excels with shots that have relatively consistent motion. For example, when walking at speed. However, erratic movement is still difficult to completely move. I'm really looking forward to playing more with this technology and applying some of the lessons that I've already learned. Can you ditch your gimbal? I'd say yes, but you'll get the best results when combining GyroFlow with a gimbal or stabilizer. We'll cover this process in more detail in a future video. But as far as I'm concerned, all new cameras should record gyro data internally. You won't need it all the time, but it should be there when you do. So I'd genuinely consider if this feature is in a camera that I'm buying. This has been a very deep depth of field kind of shoot, but the Komodo X with its Super 35 sensor is equally as capable of producing shallow depth of field. It's approximately a 1.4 times crop, so Super 35 territory. And this is shot on a 24 mm f1.4. Not wide open though, usually hovering somewhere around f2. And this is plenty shallow. If you're after that large format look though, because R has such a short flange distance, don't forget you could fit a speed booster. The Komodo X has two integrated microphones, but they're only good for scratch audio. So I've brought along with me a set of tentacle track E's and syncs for recording sync sound when I'm shooting. The sync and track E are really well-developed products. Not only do they save time in post, but they save time in production. And they also save space when I'm traveling. Now, I'm not saying that they replace the need for dedicated audio equipment, but in certain circumstances, they're more than enough. For example, my to camera parts, or I can leave a mic on the talent recording all day long. And because everything is time coded, it's a doddled sync in post. I used a sync on the camera, and then I'm using two trackies for miscellaneous audio. Again, we'll cover these in more detail in a separate video in the future. By the way, all the B-roll is being filmed on a GoPro Hero 11. Fun fact, the tentacle sync can be used with the GoPro 2. You can connect it to the GoPro's microphone input, of course, or slightly slicker, if you've got GoPro Labs installed, you can sync your GoPro with Tentacle's timecode app by simply holding it in front of the GoPro, and it then reads the timecode of the QR code. For charging, I've brought along a Ugreen 100 watt USB power supply. I can charge everything with that, including my Swift V-mount batteries, because they charge via USB-C. In years past when traveling, I've taken bulky V-mount chargers with me. The advantages of a V-mount that charges by USB-C speaks for itself, one charger to rule them all. Not only can the Swift Minnows charge by USB-C, but they are also capable of powering other electronics, so they can run double duty, power my camera, but also charge my phone and other accessories. I'm carrying two 140 watt hours and one 70 watt hour battery. With the KX, that gave me about two days of conservative shooting, more than enough. The Komodo X, dependent on lens choice, balances really nicely on gimbals such as the Ronin RS2 or RS3. I'm using a DJI RS2. I've hiked with the original Ronin S and the weight savings and additional performance of the RS2 are very welcomed. It's really hard to do the ninja gimbal walk on rocky mountain paths, so it tends to get pretty harsh treatment. But when combined with gyro flow, the results are impeccable. Another feature that sets the Komodo X apart is its global shutter. Pretty much every other camera that you think of has a rolling shutter. Global shutters excel with action and fast movement. Our shoot was pretty sedate, but it's definitely an advantage with the gyro stabilization as the software does not need to compensate for rolling shutter. You can make a time-lapse from any motion camera footage, but only some cameras can record time-lapse. The Komodo X falls into the latter category. It's a great feature to have in an adventure travel camera. Think how much storage you'd waste shooting an hour sunset at 24 frames per second. Switch the camera into time-lapse mode, and now instead of deciding how many frames it shoots a second, you get to choose how many seconds it waits to shoot a frame. Red claims 16 and a half stops of dynamic range. 
I don't have the gear to test that sort of thing. Now I can't find tests for the new KX, but the regular Komodo 6K, which also claims 16 plus stops of dynamic range, tests at under 13. That's still great. I'd imagine a similar figure for the KX. Startup times are typical of a cinema camera. This is not a mirrorless. I found that the toggle power switch really helps though, because it gives a physical indication of the power state and it's easy to operate without looking, making it easier to pre-start the camera when you know something interesting is coming up. The menus are a joy. The UI design is a little circa 2010, but well laid out and easy to navigate. Playback also works great. This is something that often gets overlooked on cameras. And the phone or tablet app and Wi-Fi connection is really well done. The image this camera produces is excellent. I shot the entire time at 6K. There's little point shooting in a lower resolution unless you want higher frame rates as it windows the sensor. I find the image to be slightly softer than other 6K cameras I've used, but that doesn't mean it's worse. Red tends to favor softer OLPFs, which has the advantage of rendering skin tones more organically and softening highlight roll off. My absolute favorite thing about the image this camera produces has to be the color. Every color is clear, nothing is muddy, skin tones are accurate. The camera is not imparting its own look to the image. Instead, it's delivering a clean image for me to fine tune in post. Its flexibility is thanks in part to its robust codec, Red Code. It's really nice to be able to do things like build qualifiers without worrying about breaking the image. I've been using Pixel Tools Hueshift DCTL to help me grade this footage. I've been particularly enjoying using it to sweeten the blue skies. Hueshift uses a concept called subtractive saturation that mimics the way that film saturates. It produces more pleasing results than simply darkening and saturating the sky. If you're interested in learning more about this tool, we'll be making a video on that soon, but in the meantime, there is a link in the description. There's so much positive stuff to say about this camera, but where do I think that there's room for improvement? The red screen is great. The brightness is fantastic. I can work with it in full daylight without a hood, and I can completely control the camera with the touchscreen. All of that, and it connects via a single cable. So what's the problem? One of the Komodo's advantages is its size. And this seven inch screen, it's not just massive, it's really heavy too. And on top of that, and this might seem petty, the interface that allows you to connect it to the camera is from the Raptor. It works great, just bugs me a little bit that it's larger than the Komodo. So what's the solution? Well, Red doesn't make a smaller screen yet. Yeah, perhaps that's something that will change in the future. But in the meantime, Red have collaborated with Small HD to give their monitors the ability to control Red cameras. So you could purchase, for example, an Indy 5 and use it to control the camera exactly the same way the official 7-inch does. Now you'll need a cage and some sort of monitor mount, not a big issue, and you'll also need three cables, power, video, and control. Again, not the worst thing in the world, but it would be great to have a lightweight 5-inch monitor that connects via a single cable. I think there's better rigging out there than the official Red accessories. I didn't like the outrigger handle for similar reasons. It's really heavy, which probably makes more sense when you're using on a heavier camera like the Raptor or Raptor XL. The top screen was quite possibly my favorite thing about the camera. The ability to strip it down to just lens, camera, and battery is amazing. I loved shooting with it like a waist level camera. Now the size of the screen wasn't an issue. The only problem was that it wasn't bright enough to use in broad daylight. So it would be amazing if the next iteration of this camera had a high bright panel. Also, I'd love to see Red or someone else design a prism or loop for it. And the only problem with that would be that you'd lose the ability to use it as a touchscreen. The camera has autofocus. It works. To be fair though, it might have worked better with native arm mount lenses. Again, I'm using ancient EF lenses. It's not something I'd use while rolling. It's a bit hunty. It's great to use before you've started rolling though, especially if you're using the inbuilt screen. You just tap on the image and it will focus where you've clicked. It also works well via the phone app, so if you're a self-shooter or monitoring the camera from a distance, happy days. A notable omission from the Komodo is internal ND. Again, thanks to the arm mount short flange, you can fit a PL or EF adapter that has an ND built in. Canon, Kipatai, and Red all make their own at various price points and with different features. So you can have internal ND, but it's gonna cost you extra on top of the camera. Sadly, I didn't have one on the shoot, so I'm using external ND. I've got a set of Polar Pro VNDs. I do wish the camera was capable of slower shutter speeds. It caps out at one sixth of a second. Obviously not an issue with motion capture, but for time-lapse, slower shutter speeds could open the possibility of night and star time lapses. I've shot those in past on other motion cameras. One other thing, the camera doesn't have any 3.5 mil or XLR inputs. 
There are audio inputs, but it's via a Limo connector. So if you did want to attach a microphone, even something simple like a Rode video mic, you need a breakout cable or box. I don't think the camera needs an XLR input, but a 3.5mm jack would help in certain scenarios. The Komodo X is by no means expensive, but it's not cheap either. It's almost twice the price of the Komodo 6K, which by the way is still very much a current camera in Red's lineup. The X isn't replacing it, it sits alongside it. The 6K was designed as a B camera, but was adopted by its users as an A camera. The Komodo X addresses all of the issues that made it difficult to use as an A camera, plus adds a bump in image quality, low light performance, frame rates, and connectivity. You should buy the camera that suits your budget and requirements. Just don't forget that you'll also want to buy an appropriate monitor, rigging, and if you're not planning on using Canon R lenses, a mount adapter with or without ND. So depending on what equipment you already have, the real price of the camera is of course higher than list. But you're getting a beautifully crafted camera for your money, the ability to use red code, and a name that people recognize when hiring you and when you step on set. There are lots of great cameras out there. The Komodo X is one of them. I've had an absolute blast using it. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more content like this in the future, make sure you're subscribed. And if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. Thanks for watching.